Well, we will get started. I think everyone is here. Matt and Kevin, you guys are ready? Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody. And we'll go right into uh, budget comments. First on the agenda. Thanks, Madam Reeve. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, coming off some not so great news on Friday with the budget. I think everybody's following that, so I guess put our seat belts on and get ready for some turbulent times. I think um, one thing that we have to recognize is that the county is probably one of the best positioned municipalities in the province in terms of financial position that um, we'll be able to withstand this probably better than most can, um, depending on how hard uh, they do hit us with this uh, shallow gas and linear stuff going forward. I'm going to outline a few things uh, for council and, and the public, I guess, to compare us to other rural municipalities uh, of similar assessment. Um, and that's sort of how we benchmark uh, is to look at how others do it so that we can see how we compare. And it's, I guess it's similar to what Jason Kenney's trying to do. He's trying to compare Alberta to the rest of Canada and he's not liking how it looks. Um, I'm kind of the opposite of that. I really like how we look, so, but I will share that. Um, I think one thing that since I've been with the county in, in 07, we've, we've climbed a steady set of stairs to get where we're at, and I really believe that the credit for most all of our success needs to go to our dedicated staff that have uh, bought in to implement um, the vision of council and uh, bring us to where we're at today. And some of the stuff that I'm going to share, I think, will, will illustrate that. Um, I believe that we've got one of the best, if not the best, uh, systems for municipalities in Alberta. We can compare numbers that others are only envious about uh, in terms of service capacity and costs and processes and streamlining and mapping. We get calls all the time. Um, from municipalities, um, inquiring the finance team, the admin team, the IT team about how we've done stuff, and everybody's more than willing to share with them our successes. We track time. Uh, we track over 1,300 processes. Uh, I encourage council or anybody to try to find another municipality that's even in the same page as that. Our laser fish is second to none in the municipal business. In fact, uh, we were in for an award at uh, the Ladies Fish Conference a couple years ago that we lost to Parks Canada, and Parks Canada has about 14,000 employees, so we've got 67. It's quite a different scale. We use forms and templates and processes and quick fields. We have tracked over 550,000 hours in the last three years at the time when I did this report. I've illustrated where that service capacity is put. Quite often, you know, through the process this summer, I heard the public mention that you have to cut operations, you need to get rid of staff, you have to contract more things out, you need to freeze wages. We track costs and benchmark continuously. We monitor our programs, we look at suggestions, we always consider complaints, and we appreciate the accolades that come in. In my experience of running municipalities, I need to run municipalities based on current demands, but most important, they need to run them on making the municipality what they want it to be in the future for their vision, and I think that's what the county Neal has done. There are so, municip so many municipalities in Alberta that have high operating costs, low capital investment, and everybody knows who's going to pay the price with that management style, and that's the future generations in those municipalities. A lot of the solutions from them and what you'll hear about is continuous whining about the province, the feds paying more, more grants, more grants, more grants. I don't think we're going to see that in any time in the future. So the province is downloading continuously. We see it in this budget again where in their view um, they're pushing it on to taxpayers of municipalities. They're taking it from those that pay corporate and personal income tax. 
down to those that pay property tax. And at the end of the day, there's only one taxpayer. But it certainly does affect the municipality, it affects the perception of the municipality. And I think we have to be clear where we are in terms of running our business. I quite often touch on the three big expenditures for the municipalities, or the big four, and I illustrated on the Schedule 1 from the financial statement um, where I get those numbers from. But it's salaries and benefits, contract services, materials, goods and supplies, and amortization. Those are really the big three and four. Transfers to organizations, other ones are soft costs normally that you have some control over. These ones, all municipalities, that's where they code their expenses for running their municipality, the core. And I think what you'll see from the numbers that I've provided is for the County Newell in 2017, and that's the last numbers on municipal affairs, uh, they will get 2018 up probably in November sometime this year. Um, but ours totaled 16.2 million and 22.7 with amortization included. And you know, the interesting thing is we've saved over $51 million of our peer group municipalities since 2008. I pulled all the numbers out of the FIR, totaled them all up, and I took them back out because year by year successes, they look good, but compound successes are amazing. And no wonder that we've been able to invest in the things that we've been able to invest in and have the ratio between operations and capital that we've had. We know those times are changing. Our core group that we compare to is ourselves, the MD of Bonneville, Cypress County, Mountain View County, Wheatland County, Brazo County, Pinocchio County, County of Wetaskiwin. They have the assessment bases right around ours. County of Newell has put in over 1,200 kilometers of water systems. Uh, no other rural municipality has that. I think the average is 48. It's quite a different scale. Those expenses are included in our expense numbers. The biggest expenses for municipalities are roads and bridges. Obviously transportation networks. I often hear urbans and um, Canadian taxpayers, people saying cost per capita of people. That does not work in rural municipalities. I think we have 4.4 people per kilometer of road. And I think in some of the, the cities they have 200 to 300 per kilometer of road. So if you're gonna compare transportation costs per capita, we're gonna be 30 times right out of the mix before we even get out of the gate. So the cost per kilometer for the County of Newell was $6,148 in 2017. The average for the peer group was 8,175. That's $2,027 per kilometer cheaper that we ran our programs and our maintenance and service levels in 2017. That works out to $3.4 million in savings. That's based on 1,692 kilometers of road network in 2017, which translates to over $40 million saved in that category since 2008. A lot of people will say, well, you don't have as many kilometers of road as we do. Well, that's true, but we figured it out per kilometer cost to show it both ways. And you would think that you, if you have more kilometers per road, you should be more efficient per kilometer. And that's not the case. Total full-time staff over the period of the county renewal was 592. And the average for the peer group was 736. That's 144 additional FTEs paid on average over 2008 to 17 than the county new has done. That saved us over $13.5 million. The county renewal hasn't fluctuated cost of living. For the staff, we followed the 2% model pretty much since I've been here. The last union negotiation, of course, was somewhat different because of a sick leave entitlement that they have and we're all familiar with. The average COLA from the Alberta inflation calculator was 2.23 over the last 20 years, so we're underneath of that, and I believe we are managing that better than others. 
we don't go from five, four, six, zero, zero. And I believe our staff appreciate this, and I believe it's easier and better to manage this way. I think the bottom line from what I'm saying is that we are a leader in municipal systems, certainly from a streamlined and operational perspective. And all of us as staff are very proud of that accomplishment. That success, as I mentioned, didn't happen overnight. And I want to again thank all of them for their commitment to that for our ratepayers. When I hear negative or more so uneducated criticism, I want to offer a few relevant additional facts. In the province, there's 64 municipal districts and county. Our equalized assessment in 2018 was less than it was in 2014. We have seen only a 28% growth in our assessment in the past 10 years, while the average of our peer group has been 57%. When you add combined mill rates, totaling both mill rates, those have increased both for us 11% in that time and the peer group average 11%. But when you look at that and you calculate 57 plus the 11, that's 69%, minus the 39% that the province average peer group is equals we have, we have been at a reduction of 29% in revenue since 2008. We're carrying 66 million in net financial assets in 2017, and that's 15 million over our peer group. We've transferred to boards, agencies, individuals, organizations, and municipalities just over 85 million in assets over that period. And the reason that I say assets, it's both cash and uh, as well as regional water infrastructure. The average peer group for the average for our peer group was 34 million. That's a 51 million dollar difference. Accumulated surplus was 278 million in 2018, and we were 44 million over the average for our peer group during that period. We were just over 10 million dollars in difference in 2008, so that's a 34 million dollar shift upwards. So if you add the 85 million that we've transferred plus the accumulated surplus gross of 144 million, that equals 225 million over that period. These are lots of big numbers, but they're painting the picture. Our remaining capital asset life is at 75%. We are near the top of the province. So back to my philosophy of low operating costs, high capital investments puts you and us in the perspective where we are today. The average municipal district and county depreciation is about 54%. So that'll show you the difference. So when you have $7.5 million in depreciation and you're only investing $4 or $5 million in capital asset program, you're going to squeeze in to the scale that everybody else is faced with. So we are going to have some room to meet these challenges. It's going to be tough, but I don't believe that... Um, operations need to be adjusted here, should be adjusted, because I think we lead the way. I see a common trend over the past 10 years. I'm sure you all do too, and we're all proud of those accomplishments. There's two things that I committed to when I joined this team in 2007, and that was to leave the municipality in a better off position when I'm no longer here, and that's to give our future councils the advantage of one of the best managed municipalities in the province, and that's what we've been committed to. Yes, I'm tooting our horn, but I do believe after this past year that we have that somebody needs to toot it and needs to say it, and so thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate it. When you, com when you contemplate this budget and future budgets, make the tough dis decisions, but always keep the end vision in your sights because that's what we're all here for. We're not here for today. We're here for what it's going to do to the future to our, our generations and the future generations. So I've attached some backup information that shows you some of our assessments. I color coded it because it's easier to look at. But you will see um, the equalized assessment for the province and where the nine, $950 billion, uh, what it's made up of. You can see the, the residential as 
per category of counties and cities and non-residential and machinery and equipment. You can see the equalized assessment by category in the province. Um, of course, farmland is 0.65%. We know that it's uh, one of the smallest numbers, if not the smallest. You can see that linear assessment uh, based on equalized. And then you can see the county of Newell on the right, and that shows you where our assessments are. And of course, yellow is our biggest, which is linear, which we're all familiar with, that's going to be shaved down going forward. The interesting thing that you'll note with these graphs is that linear is only 8% of the assessment in the province. While it gets a lot of attention, it's big to us and it's big to those that have these costs associated with the activity that is in your region, but it's not big in the big provincial scheme of things. So I hope sometime that the province shifts its focus off of that 8% and starts to look at things more bigger and more important. The rest of the numbers I'm not going to go through. It's just back up to show um, those assessment numbers, factors with regards to our mill rates, um, net financial assets, all of that information. I did run the net financial asset ratio, or we're at 2.05 times, and we didn't make the first 100 municipalities in that. So if anybody thinks that we're carrying too much cash, um, we're not even on the first 100. So I do believe that you do have to keep uh, reserves, and uh, I do believe that my number, personal number, is two, two times. So. I would encourage you not to, to dip into that too much um, because there may be a day when that is going to be required. I'm going to finish off with, it's been a pleasure working with everybody. I know times are going to be tough moving forward and I look forward to continuing with this team to make sure this gets implemented in a positive and progressive manner. Thank you. Glad you had, were ready to throw him back down into his chair, uh, Kelly. Good job, Kelly. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I enjoy all of the, the stuff that you can pull together for us to help us work our way through. 8% linear in the province. Yeah, we sort of focus, get stuck on that one, don't we? That's, that's an interesting... Yeah, yeah, the province is wise to get there because there is, can't, won't be a lot of pushback, just the few municipalities that are, yeah, as we know, the 15 that took the hit already. So set in that sort of introduction, we'll continue along and... Uh, move on to Matt's budget summary and his presentation. I can't compete with uh, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> he had sent me an early draft of that and uh, it was nice to, uh, it was nice to uh, read. Um, it's really nice to reflect back, I think, 10 years for, for the county. Uh, it's incredible what the county has accomplished in a relatively short period of time. When I was applying for uh, the manager of finance job here, I got on your website, which was in black and uh, neon green tones, if you remember that website. I couldn't find a lot of information about people. Stephanie was on there. Susan Shigahiro was on there. Uh, not a lot of information. Uh, when I came to the county, the systems that we had... <laughs> had available were really onerous to try and do anything with. Um, and then you fast forward to uh, today, um, we're dealing with systems that give us relatively quick access to the information that we're, we're looking for. Uh, 
you received the budget package on October 18th. If you remember my first budget with those of you who were here, uh, you received the budget package the day you walked into the, uh, <laughs> the council chambers. It's a little embarrassing to uh, reflect back on. Uh, I think we're in a position now where we can make rational decisions. Uh, we've got the time to consider things. We've now got a view with the new budget software that council invested in that we're looking, today we're looking 10 years down, but I've got 20 years of capital modeled. Uh, I feel pretty comfortable with the numbers that are, are in here, that we've captured the big items that are gonna impact us going forward. Um, so today we're, we're gonna be looking at uh, specifically the 2020 budget but it's never just a year in isolation. We want to take the long view, and I think we've got that information in front of uh, council today. So I'll jump on to uh, the soapbox and give a, a high-level overview. I do want to say, uh, maybe just for the benefit of everybody who's here, where we're kind of at in the process, it seems like budget never ends, right? We're either <laughs> we're in some kind of budget cycle of one kind of another. We got together August 1st, council, senior management, meeting open to the public, and we tried to determine what uh, the priorities would be moving into 2020, any service level changes that we needed to consider and uh, incorporate into the first draft. After that, everybody starts scrambling, getting information together, building the budget package. They get that to me by the end of September. I scramble for a couple of weeks to uh, make sure that we funded everything, that uh, things uh, make sense. Uh, you get the package October 18th, chew on it for a few days, and now we're here in another meeting that's open to the public. Uh, everything in front of us is draft. Nothing has been set in stone yet, so we're going to kick this thing around and see if uh, what we've proposed is, is reasonable. Between now and December 5th, we'll incorporate any kind of changes that we, we settle on today and hopefully December 5th, we'll, we'll approve that interim budget for the 2020 year. And then we circle back around in April once we know what the province does to our assessment year modifiers for linear is the biggest wild card for me that I've really tried to, you know, really struggled figuring out where, where's our assessment going because that's gonna impact a lot of what we decide to do with our, our mill rates. Uh, I always like to throw this up because really these are the guiding principles that we, we espouse and we try to uh, uh, make sure all of our, our decisions are, are guided by these. Uh, I've highlighted sustainable and stability. Uh, when the province throws us instability, we want to temper that and try to provide as much stability to our ratepayers as possible. Uh, Kevin has highlighted that we are in a good financial position to be able to do that. Uh, strong infrastructure, Kevin highlighted again, we've got about 75% of our assets useful lives available to us. We've got excellent roads. I, when I was looking at our long-term financial plan and the, the assets that we need to replace, I, there's nothing that is visible to me that says, well, because of what the province did on Friday, we have to shelve projects. All the other headlines, Medicine Hat, Calgary, Edmonton, oh, we got to have emergency meetings and decide what we're going to postpone. Uh, the county's in position to continue financing their capital and their operating. Uh, we might take a hit on what our long-term savings plan looks like, uh, but there are no projects on the books today that we have to say, well, pump the brakes, we need to totally regroup. Uh, I think that speaks volumes to how the county has taken a, there was a line in the uh, Minister of Finance budget speech about the province taking control of their financial future. The county's already done that. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the budget overview. I'm pretty pleased with the budget that we have in front of you. I think it's extremely conservative. I, I've presented a two and a half million dollar hit to our tax revenues, which I don't know where we want to settle out on that, but if the province hits us with a 30% decrease in linear assessment, 
and we want to remain competitive on our non-residential mill rate. 30% uh, decrease in linear assessment loses about 698 million in assessment. That translates into just over $5.2 million in tax if we do nothing with our mill rate. We're gonna have to increase that non-residential mill rate to just lose two and a half. The two and a half kind of approximates what we sent back in net municipal taxes for that shallow gas tax refund. So that, that's where that number's coming from. I don't know if we wanna stay there or say, nope, we're, to, we're gonna take the same dollar amount from non-residential uh, next year. But as it's modeled, you can take a two and a half million dollar hit. We can recover that with a 2% increase over the next five years. Uh, the cost of that would be, uh, I think, just over seven and a half million dollars that you you give up in tax revenue over that five years if you pursue this uh, this strategy. But it does recognize some of the direction coming from the province, uh, looking for some relief for their their taxpayers, and it does recognize the difficulty of our shallow gas producers, which have been very good to the county. Uh, I'll, I'll point out, we budget pretty low for our well drilling tax each year because it's something that's out of our control. You know, it's typically between $100,000, $150,000. So I looked back to uh, 2011, 2011 to 2019, we had budgeted $995,000 for revenue coming from well drilling. We've received $3.8 million from well drilling tax. So. Uh, there might be some arguments in favor of providing some relief to your uh, your shallow gas guys. On on the expense side, uh, you don't see it here, but in the the executive summary where it provides a little more detail, uh, we're presenting a budget which has the lowest FTEs budgeted in the last five years. So we, because of some of the system changes that you've put into place. Uh, Finance and municipal services have been collaborating the last two years. Our payroll and finance support clerk has been providing support to that department where typically they would hire a seasonal position. We're comfortable enough now, two years in, that we get along well enough that you could probably remove that seasonal position. We don't need to plan on that. We can bank on uh, the continued collaboration. Uh, last year, you also had FTEs for uh, retirements, those have been pulled out, that was in an FTE. Uh, so salaries are down net of the 2% COLA. Um, three categories there, salaries down 98,000. We're gonna get that down a little bit further. Uh, we're also gonna remove a project admin assistant which was 0.77 FTE. So that'll knock it uh, further savings, about 61,000 on top of that 98. Uh, 88,000 less for contracted and general services and uh, over half a million in your materials, good supplies. That one's maybe a little overstated because we uh, had the AFRAX last year for 330 some odd thousand. So that one maybe looks a little bit better than, uh, than it otherwise would for status quo. But uh, we're coming uh, with a budget that is conservative but it also continues to get the capital projects invested in that are, are important to the community. Uh, Kevin's talked about assessment, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, review that. Uh, I've included a, a summary of where we fall for tax rate competitiveness. It's the same slide that we saw at the budget planning meeting. Uh, the take home message here is we've got room to move on farmland rates and remain competitive non-residential rates could go up and you'd remain competitive. Uh, residential, you're in the middle of the pack. There's others who are more competitive than us, uh, residential-wise, but you do have room to, uh, to move on on that if you, you needed to. Revenues, really, we're, property taxes is our, our bread and butter. Right, we, we have been moving on, on user fees the last number of years. We typically go up for our utilities. Uh, we've got just under a 5% increase in utility rates proposed. Looking at increasing the rate for the minibus ride. Uh, we've also incorporated the direction from budget planning to increase the cost recovery rate on dust abatement for residential from 50% to uh, 65%. So we, 
we are trying to tie some of those price signals into the services that we, uh, we provide so people can vote with their dollars what they, what they value. Uh, but really, property taxes is our, our big revenue source. And when the province in a single year uh, rumors 30% decreases in our largest assessment category, that, uh, that does cause us some concern. Uh, expenses, salaries, wages, benefits, 30%. Contracted services, 17. Materials, goods, supplies, 18. Transfers. I think the county really should be proud of what it has accomplished with its, its partners. We, we have shared a lot. Um, we had the Regional Enhancement and Cooperation Agreement for a number of years, which transferred a lot, a lot of dollars. I really think the region, in working together, has positioned the region well for uh, dealing with these turbulent financial times. Uh, staffing summary, so I've kind of already talked about this a little bit. Let's just see if there's any other details I wanted to throw at you here. Yeah, overall decrease here, it's showing 2.83. We're, we're actually going to get that up another 0.77. So you'll have a decrease of 3.6 FTE in budget. So we'll be at uh, 71.32. Uh, total full-time equivalents uh, budgeted. Tangible capital assets. We we spend a lot of money on on capital. Uh, the budget planning meeting we kicked around the idea of scaling back the drainage partnership with EID. Do we scale back on gravel road rehabilitation? Gravel roads, we typically throw $1.8 million annually at. Uh, and the appetite there was for us to complete the 2020 gravel road study before we start messing with, with these plans. So 1.8 for gravel road rehab. Rattleback, if we can get it complete next year, is in there at an estimate of 1.7. We'll, uh, we'll play with that number once we get closer to uh, an actual plan. EID is in there again at the standard 1 million. We've got 440,000 in currently for bridge files. Um, we're working with the data set that Alberta Transportation provides for bridge files. They uh, have an estimated replacement year and an estimated replacement cost. And when we talk to them, they advise us that those are loose numbers. Uh, the two files that are included for uh, 2020 are, there's two files that are slated to be inspected, so we might be able to actually kick those out a few more years. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Replacing IT infrastructure, 350,000. Rolling Hills truck parking lot, 100,000. Uh, commitment to fire, a rescue unit for Bassano, a bush buggy for Bassano, totaling 500,000. An engine in Bow City, and a rescue unit in, in GEM. Um, I think you're going to have a very well-positioned fire and emergency uh, response team uh, with the fire apparatus that they have access to. Um, I expect you'll grill our department heads on the new items they want to add to your, <laughs> your equipment pool. So we've got a 20-foot hooded sprayer, a 60-horsepower tractor, portable compressor and trailer for recharging the SCVA packs for our... Uh, emergency responders, and a vending machine for the shop at 15,000. Um, those are some of the highlights for, for TCA. Debt summary. <laughs> We're in an $18 million building, fully paid. It's got decades of useful life left. Uh, you've got a rural water system, 50 million plus. It'll be fully paid end of 2023, decades of useful life uh, available. Uh, we're positioned really well if, uh, if things just tank on our, our linear assessment. We were positioned really well uh, to come up with a debt strategy for, for any kind of infrastructure moving forward. Uh, so Really, the only better time for things to get tight at the provincial level would have been 2023 for us. Uh, restricted surplus summary. We visit this every year. Are we saving enough? 
My quick response would be no, because we don't fund 100% of amortization. Uh, we're only funding 50% of amortization on roads, water, sewer, uh, things like that. And we know that our water and sewer rates do not cost recover enough, even on just the, uh, the operating side. So that would be my knee jerk, is that no, we're, we're probably not saving enough. We could probably look at our restricted surplus policy and bump that 50% saved up to 100%. But then somebody could counter argue and say, well, we need to bank on some grants from the province because we typically get some kind of grant funding if we're going to do a sewer project or, or things like that. So how much you want to save really comes down to a philosophy. But in an ideal world where the county takes total control of its financial future, we don't bank on the province for, for capital grants. We look at strategic debt local improvement taxes for, for those places that benefit from water, sewer. Uh, even, you could even look at it for local roads, sidewalks. Uh, but we're positioned well, I think. Uh, some of the things I wanted to highlight for, for restricted surplus, our stabilization fund there, 3.15, that's about 10% of our annual operating. That's supposed to deal with shocks like, <laughs> I don't know. We're sitting on about $2 million of uh, property taxes right now from oil and gas companies, which might end up uh, being doubtful. We're not in as bad a shape as uh, Woodlands County, which I think they're writing off north of $8 million. They're kind of in panic mode. Uh, so that stabilization fund, where we end in 2019, we might want to pad that a little bit more to deal with some of these uncertainties related to uh, tax collectability. On the linear side of things, the province hasn't done us any favors in the legislation, the MGA, for our ability to collect on that. We send demand letters from the lawyer. Some are good, some pay, and some know exactly our, our capabilities to actually collect on those. So until you see something enshrined in the, uh, the legislation that says that linear taxes Municipalities do have a special lien on those. We're just waiting. Uh, so we have $2 million sitting there. Other risks, the police costing model, half a million to potentially $2 million. See where that one shakes out. ICFs with our partners. We've got Bassano figured out. I think we're pretty close on Duchess, but we still have Brooks and uh, Rosemary to figure out. So. Where, where are those numbers gonna, gonna go? Um, the projection that I've provided you here for the restricted surplus uh, assumes that the hit we take, or the modeled hit, that two and a half million, is all we take. And then moving forward, we have 2% growth. Uh, if we don't have 2% growth or it keeps going down, this is not gonna be the same, same picture. Uh, offsets, the good news is I have not included any capital grants in our long-term capital. So if the province does come through with, you know, one and a half, two million dollars annually moving forward, which they've kind of signaled through that uh, local government fiscal framework, which is supposed to replace the MSI, that's uh, potentially a good news story for our long-term financial plan. Uh, other things that may be good for us, our pavements lasting longer than we, we had modeled. One Tree Road, uh, would have been overlaid in 2019 based on a 20-year useful life. We're going into 2020 where we're going to do the study, uh, have the engineers run that road to see what the best uh, approach is. So if we can get some more useful life out of our, our roads and that's consistently happening, we'll, we'll start uh, including that into our model. All right, so just a, a recap. Really, in most of the areas of operations, it's status quo. Uh, Ratepayers are going to receive the same level of service that they're accustomed to. Uh, with the caveat, uh, planned service level decreases in non-residential dust abatement, which we talked about during the budget planning, removing 15 and a half kilometers from that, and alternate painting of shoulder lines on paved roads to every other year. So a few. Uh, decreases. Cost of living is in there at 2%. Uh, 
Uh, municipal tax revenue decreases, nets out at 2.46, so you're going to lose 2.5 from non-res, get another 105 from farmland, and we're flat on residential. Utili utility rates increasing, 4.5 to 4.9%, uh, dust abatement cost recovery 50 to 65%, and minibus rider fee increases by 250 per trip. Uh, forecast years, like I said, in, include a 2% tax revenue growth, except for farmland, which we're talking about getting that farmland rate equivalent to your, your non-res rate by about 2023. Uh, department heads where they know they've got one-time items coming up, we've included that into the, uh, the operating forecast. So one-time things would be like the cost of an election, uh, council retreat, management retreat prior to an election, uh, items like that. Uh, MSI operating, we're expecting to end in 2021. We typically have thrown that operating grant at uh, corporate safety, bylaw, and solid waste. Isn't a huge component of, of what we do, but it, it is uh, just over $100,000. But that has been removed from our, our forecast moving forward. Uh, it was nice that the province reduced red tape and made it less onerous for us. We, we didn't have to submit uh, a plan of what we were going to do with that operating. We're only going to have to report. So uh, that's nice. And I am excited to see what the province does for, for reducing red tape because it seems like on the big dollar grant, so our $3 million a year MSI, we don't have to do very much. But if we want $20,000 of disaster recovery assistance, uh, we submit 100% of the invoices, and we receive a visit from three, three grant coordinators from Edmonton. So that, that will be a, a welcome uh, change from the province. Paving overlays are in based on a 20-year schedule and 200,000 per kilometer. Paving plan based on 600,000 per kilometer. And bridge files based on the best information we can get from Alberta Transportation. Um, overall, it, it's really a pri <laughs> I think it's really a privilege to be the, uh, the finance manager at the, uh, the County of Newell. There's other municipalities I would not care to be the finance manager at right now. I'm sure I'd have a lot more sleepless nights. Um, so thank you to count Council and uh, Kevin for your vision, positioning us well enough that uh, it has made my, my job a real pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Anybody have any questions of Matt? Clarence. I have a question. I'd like to make some comments first. You know, when I went over the budget, it really gives me uh, a lot of comfort that really all I have to read is the philosophy behind it. I don't even hardly even look at the numbers because I trust our staff that they know what they're doing with the numbers. But the philosophy behind it is just excellent, and I fully endorse it. The one thing I'd, li I'd like to, I was really glad that we kept the drainage product project on stream because I don't think we have a number that really emphasizes the fact that one of our largest Expenses, which we know are roads, but how much we rely on the Eastern Irrigation District to have a good system which keeps water out of the ditches. I don't think we can put a number to that on how long that, how, how much extra life we get out of our road system because of that. So I think that's a, that's just, it's just such a huge part of what we do and it's such an integral part of how we have to work together with, with our irrigation provider in this, this area. Because I can remember when there was water in ditches, and when there's water in ditches in the spring, you have trouble. And we hardly see that anywhere now. And that's, that's invaluable. The other thing, I mean, we talk about 50% on the roads and that it's only 
fund it to the 50% level. I think that's probably good because I'm not sure we, I'm pretty convinced that we amortize it too quickly. I think the life of our roads are, high, are more than what we are saying. And that, of course, puts that out of balance. And that, so I, I feel very comfortable with the 50%. I agree that we should be putting that stabilization fund, bumping it a little bit because we're, the times are too uncertain. And Kevin pointed out the 8% on linear that the province gains. I think that's a, that's a, that's very, very dangerous for us because if the province is looking at where the least public impact will be, it's at 8%. I don't think we should forget that. We can't really plan for it. The one question I have, Matt, is we paid out 3.4 and I, and I, I think it's in your, in your net numbers of 2.5, which we, which we uh, said would be less next year. I, I'm wondering why maybe that's a little conservative or maybe you can just explain it a little better to me because I don't quite understand that difference. Yeah, that's a good question. If you look at the, uh, the story in the bulletin, it says we refunded 3.4 million to our shallow gas. That's correct. We sent them three and three point four million dollars back. Of that, uh, two point five, two point four was our share, net municipal taxes. The other bit was your your school foundation and Newell Foundation portions. Questions? No? All right. We will just move into the sections then, starting with municipal services. Thank you, Matt. That was, uh, I'm, I'm not a numbers person, but I do enjoy when you and Kevin do the narrative and sort of roll it all up so that it makes some sense to people like me. It's appreciated. So we're going to go through this sort of by category, I take it, like on the agenda. So by law enforcement would be the first item, 3-1. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Mark here. Really in uh, bylaw enforcement, there aren't uh, a lot of significant changes. There's a few uh, items I think Mark will speak to on the uh, supply side or material side that are kind of bumping things up. Overall, looking at 8.9% uh, increase over the, uh, the prior year. Most of that coming from your, your salaries increase. Uh, which would be merit and cost of living, and your amortization. So you'll see amortization went up uh, by 44%. Uh, the cost of a CPO unit, I think we were at uh, around 68 for our old ones, and we're north of 90,000 for, uh, for replacement. So the, uh, that drives your, your amortization up moving forward kind of a thing. Um, has some impact on what we sock away into reserves. Uh, but those would be the two really big items there. I'll let Mark speak to the rest of that function. Yeah, well, good morning. Privileged to be here again. This is uh, 11 years for me now presenting budget to council. And uh, as you've heard already this morning, it's gotten uh, a lot better over the years. So this uh, Kevin's, Kevin's opening and, and Matt's follow-up, I, I don't have anything further to contribute to that because I think they summed it up all very well for those of us that are here to speak following. Um, yes, function 26, um, very much status quo. Um, one thing I want to point out is, again, with the AFRAX radios and stuff, we have uh, a cost coming to us next year to make sure that our staff are, are mobile with that AFRAX and, uh, and moving forward. And then the other thing that uh, changed for us over the last year was, uh, of course, the legalization of cannabis. Um, we haven't had any... Um, 
property seizures of small size in the uh, past, but uh, not long after the legalization of cannabis, we did have some seizures that we had to deal with, not having anything really uh, within uh, the county's office to store that um, securely with just the uh, CPOs having access to that. We, we do have in there approximately $2,000 uh, for a, a safe just to be able to lock that up because uh, if the courts order us to return that property to the owner We have to return it to the owner um, Other than that any property seizures that we've had uh, Large size items. Uh, we have had a boat in uh, recent past uh, We've been sending those off to private compounds for those people to manage on our behalf Don't really think we want anything in our possession that attracts unwanted guests to our property for any reason whatsoever so um, the, this exhibit storage, more or less, uh, you think of uh, a safe that's just like two feet wide by three feet tall or whatever to be able to put uh, smaller quantities of things into than in a secure manner that somebody just can't pick up and walk out of here with. Um, that would be appreciated. Other than that, uh, Matt did talk about the amortization of the units. Just finding that the units that we did purchase, uh, what is that, about eight years ago now? Um, we had five-year life expectancy on them. We did push the limit on the, the life expectancy of those units to seven years. We finally replaced after eight. Uh, finding uh, through our experience working with the municipal partners, sometimes with the units that we had gotten into, the ground clearance that we had wasn't sufficient. We were ripping off those nice front spoilers on the, on the vehicle and, and whatnot, uh, just causing unnecessary damage when we're out and about in, in some of those areas that uh, we don't have roads, but more or less tra trails to travel, and uh, really looking to uh, work with those sorts of things in the future that we have less downtime with our vehicles, and we have the properly sized fleet to deal with what we need to deal with and, and get our officers around safely. So if there's any questions on function 26, I guess I'd be happy to answer them. Don't see any. So well, we'll that's great. Go on to 31. That was a great start to the morning. Thank you. Fleet services. Function 31, fleet services. Uh, again, some legislated things that have come our way. Um, the disposal of slurry. So the mixing of water and soils, uh, whether they're contaminated soils or not, knowing whether they are contaminated soils or not, Legislation says that we have specific ways that we have to deal with that to separate the liquids from the solids and uh, and deal with contamination wherever it sits on those sites. So some of those costs have gone up uh, due to the nature of having sumps and, and collection uh, services within our shop. We do have to have a hydrovac come in, remove those, uh, those wastes and stuff and dispose of them properly. And that's coming at a, a fair increase compared to what we've experienced in the past. Um, the other uh, matter with stuff here um, is we're looking at uh, replacing our hydrovac trailer. It was a, it's, it's a mini vac and it was more or less purchased for the sole purpose of hydrovacking uh, small holes for sign replacements and stuff. Um, not really sure that when we bought it, not even sure what the unit number is on that, but back in back before I started anyway. Uh, so 2008 or, or, or prior, uh, I, I don't think it was really a properly sized unit to deal with what we needed to deal with. It didn't leave the yard as frequently as it needed to, and uh, we're just looking at getting something more adequately sized so we can take some of this work upon ourselves rather than paying contracted service to do some of it. So that replacement is slated in here. And uh, of course, a vending machine. Um, the last three years, we've had uh, Valen had supplied us with a vending machine for high turnover, um, non-inventory uh, items, so your gloves, your electrical tape, spray paints, things like that. Just something that staff weren't generically picking out of a box and seeing things that grew legs. We actually had to use the same key cards that you used to access the building to tap into that vending machine. It would record who opened the doors. There was like seven cameras in that thing, so Good luck getting thing, anything out of there unless you're a magician uh, without it knowing, but uh, you would scan what you were taking. And it also allowed you the ability to return uh, goods that uh, weren't fully consumed when you, when you used them. 
they withdrew that uh, vending machine um, looking for more profitable locations to put their machine. What it really served was a great opportunity for our staff to access things when the parts room was not available. So sometimes our, uh, our plow truck operators are in at four o'clock in the morning. They don't have a key to the parts room. We wanna keep our inventory under control and be the responsibility of our fleet and inventory control clerk. Anybody else that's dabbling in there, things that walk away don't get recorded and stuff, that all creates questions as to where did it go and who took it. Um, this vending machine was kind of the solution. We're proposing $15,000 in budget because that is the approximate cost of a new machine. We also want to investigate what other solutions might be out there that are going to be lesser cost. And maybe we do find ourselves with putting something in place that we test the waters with staff to see how honest and truthful they are and whether we can keep our costs as low as what we had it before. That is really where we're at with function 31. Nothing, anything of any real value as far as I'm concerned, but the vending machine was a nice ordeal for our uh, inventory assistant and then to assist staff for things that they needed after hours. Any questions? Yes. <coughs> I guess my question is, I wasn't aware we had a small hydro vac. Are you sure that you have that you're budgeting for a large enough one now. Because every time I see, see an expense fixing something somewhere, whether it's an NRC, which we pay for, one of the major costs is that hydrovac cost truck. So I just caution you, please don't buy another one that's too small. Yeah, I guess some of where we want to go really with that is we, we don't want to go with the full-blown Hydrovac truck. Um, it it uh, with, what, with the work that we want to do, we just want to make sure that it's properly sized, that we can get out there and, and get it done as efficiently as we possibly can. The, the trailer that we currently had, um, we would be making multiple trips back and forth to dump because it just didn't have the capacity to, to store uh, enough to keep our staff going and when staff are sitting on site waiting for something else to dump we're not being as efficient as possible. Uh, to go with a full-blown truck, uh, I think the city just replaced theirs and, and somewhere around $450,000 or something like that for a hydrovac truck and I know that those machines are not the uh, most reliable. They have a lot of issues with them on a regular basis with high use and stuff. Um, we're, we're really not in the same business as the city of Brooks and, and, and people like that, but uh, we do want to have something that we can clean out the catch basins with in, in each of our hamlets, get some signposts installed when we need to get them installed and not have to rely on a $450,000 unit coming out at $250 or $400 an hour to do it for us when our staff will, will already be capable of doing such with something that we can cost recover over 10 years. Wayne. What are we looking at costs here for that back unit that you're looking for? Uh, we got 150 in there to work with to make sure that uh, we, we've, we've, um, we've looked at that. Um, yeah, for some reason we got the note in 31. It's actually budgeted for in 32. Um, Hopefully under uh, tender, tendering practice and stuff like that, we would see it come in underneath of that, but we have looked at a model that we find satisfactory. We just got to find out who else has uh, the uh, similar kind of units, what kind of prices they come out in at with a tender. Other questions? Carry on. Moving forward, 32. Again, pretty well status quo with, uh, with most everything here. Um, you know, we talked previously about the, the larger things here. Matt already summarized uh, the seasonal assistance. Um, relationship with finance has been great. Uh, we are looking at moving forward with implementing the uh, tablets here to, to make staff um, single point of entry with their timesheets and such, what they haven't been able to do. 
which will uh, alleviate a lot more time on that financial position that's been assisting us and uh, repurposing that position to do other tasks as well and provide further assistance or, or other work throughout the organization is what we're looking at. Um, so that removal for us is, is pretty easy to remove that seasonal admin and it saves us training somebody every time we were bringing somebody in because we weren't uh, always getting the same person back. We, we, we did fairly well at getting them back for a couple of years, but uh, there was always a retaining, retraining component uh, when somebody new come on. Uh, gravel exploration, $150,000. You know, I've talked about this for probably five to seven years now. Uh, we're finally at the point that we can get around to getting this un underway. Um, uh, the RFP, I think, is probably going to be something early on in the new year and uh, and start moving on this because uh, our resource in Bazano is very limited at this time. Our, our, our pit life expectancy is coming to an end. Uh, we do have options to purchase from uh, existing private resources if, if necessary, but uh, finding our own in the future is, is best so that we own and control. Um, not sure whether we're going to be owning in the future either because it all depends on what kind of negotiations and what kind of costs we're looking at and we'll cross those roads when we get there. Finding the resource is the first step. Overlay research on One Tree Road. Um, RFP's out and we'll be waiting on that recommendation coming forward. As Matt talked, uh, what we want to do is catch these roads uh, close to their uh, overlay period, investigate them, find out how much more time we need we, we have available to us before we actually go through an expenditure to see uh, a reinvestment in that infrastructure. The further out we can push those things, so long as we're uh, preserving that existing infrastructure, the better off we'll be for our ratepayers. So uh, that research right now is going on here and we'll have some of those others coming up as we reach those kind of life expectancies of, of other roads. Rural road study, $150,000. First study we ever had done was in 2012 with me here. Uh, it's time that we update. We've done a lot in the last uh, seven years of road shoulder pulls, rehabilitation, complete reconstruction of things. We've had a lot of learning. Uh, we believe we found a good fit for the county of Newell that's cost effective, works within our irrigation district where we have a lot of power services and irrigation pivots that spin around and uh, create a lot uh, less headache for our ratepayers when we do shoulder pulls versus conventional reconstruction. So. If we can look at getting that study done, council approves it, we'll identify what our next set of priorities on our roads are for rehabilitation, if there are any, and uh, put that decision in the council's hands moving forward as to where we go and how we get there based on some recommendations that we might be able to bring back to council for consideration. Sidewalks in Hamlets, generally there's about $4,000 in there, so uh, we never know when we're gonna have that frost heave or that pop crack settlement or whatever. Uh, some kind of money in there for something, grinding of trip and fall hazards because that is one of the things we have to take care of in our, in our hamlets. Uh, generally, we're pretty good here. Hamlet of Scandia, pretty well all new concrete sidewalk, curb and gutter. Tilly, we did a lot of curb and gutter uh, replacements. We did some sidewalk replacements, but a lot of that was also separate sidewalk that we didn't have to touch when we went through the improvements. So that's one of the areas that if there is something to be done, I, I would be predicting it being Tilly. Um, really anywhere else. We don't have any sidewalks. We don't have any in Patricia, Lake Newell Resort or Rolling Hills. So uh, people use the roadways as they need to for uh, their foot and, and bicycle transportation. Greater site environmental assessments. Uh, as you know, we have had greater sites located on private property in the past. We are slowly relocating all of those to be on county property. We just want to make sure that when we leave a site, we're leaving it in as good a condition or better than when we uh, situated ourselves there. So uh, site assessments for Division 4 budgeted this year, and as uh, we go through the plan, we'll be slowly re relocating the rest, and those will uh, continue to be there. Gravel crush in, Baz in Bazano and Ballast, uh, $3.1 million. Uh, Matt came to me with a suggestion on how we look at these gravel crushes, because when they do come up, it's a fairly significant number that comes across the budget, so we're looking at standardizing those kind of costs across the number of years until we get to the next crush to uh, level that trend rather than having those peaks and valleys in, in our expenditures for you and, uh, and therefore making it easier for uh, revenues to uh, offset. Rolling Hills truck parking lot. We were at $30,000. Uh, we're looking at $100,000. This is just a gravel site. 
This is to accommodate the uh, turning movements of trucks on the site to get themselves situated, to get themselves back out. Something significant enough that with the grout, with the uh, heavy truck traffic in there, because they may be loaded, they may be unloaded, uh, that we don't have a lot of uh, heaving and soft spots show up that we're continually maintaining. If we're gonna build it, we wanna build it right and we wanna do it the first time. Uh, if we wanna build on top of that to provide lighting and security fen secure fencing and stuff like that in the future, those would be additional costs, but right now we are talking a gravel pad with uh, two access points. Two access points have been uh, considered and I believe approved by Alberta Transportation. Uh, so what we're proposing within this budget is the additional funding of another $70,000 to make it happen. So I will leave that one in your consideration for approval. Bridge files, Matt already talked about. Uh, also budgeted in here is the 15th Avenue and Highway 873 signalization. Um, those have already been discussed with our partners and whatnot on those. The EID partnership is status quo at $1 million each. Shoulder pulls, Matt already summarized, $1.8 million. Uh, we are in the final year. If we update the study, then uh, we'll be identifying potentially other uh, roads for rehabilitation if we need to go down that route and uh, really be looking at where we sit with the uh, current service level on roads and be talking about what council's expectation is on those service levels and how we want to maintain them in the future moving forward to, based on what kind of dollars you want to throw at it. So, um, Paving plan, this is the time of year that everybody gets to see the paving plan one more time. If there's anything further that needs to be discussed about the paving plan, um, I guess this is uh, where we want it to be unless council advises otherwise to uh, bring the paving plan to a future council meeting where we can discuss it in greater detail. We can look at that. But uh, with that, the uh, overlays funded uh, are being funded from the paving reserve until the infrastructure fund is replenished based on the borrowing for the uh, partnership that we got into with, with the province. And uh, new pavement uh, right now, your next project is 2026, which is old Highway 1A from Highway uh, 875 East to Tilly. So uh, we, do, we don't have anything on the books for paving. And um, yeah, really, here we are. This is what it looks like. It's pretty status quo for us. We've got some things that we need to get after though. And, and I think with having uh, the accomplishments that we've had over the last 10 years, we have the ability to move on some of these other things now that are, that are top priority for us. So if there's any questions with 32. Tracy, um, what is the expected maintenance um, and expense on this parking lot in Rolling Hills? Like, so we invest 100,000 and we get it built. Ongoing, what's gonna be the expense of it? To, we're gonna send the grader out there and level it and keep adding gravel? Like, what does that long-term look like? Um, from, from my observation, the long-term really wouldn't be a whole lot different than what we see in our operations yard here. Maybe one to two times a year with a grader on it to, uh, to grade it flat if necessary. That's about it. To uh, preserve our aggregate, We've included costs in there to lay, to lay geotextile fabric to ensure that the clay remains separated from the aggregate. And uh, really the only thing that can affect that is if there's a bunch of muddied trucks that come in and deposit a lot of clay and stuff like that that uh, gets worked into it to create an issue. But generally we would be looking at removing that uh, from the site ourselves. Nothing significant. Yeah, I guess I just questioned, so I could I'm drawing a little bit of a blank about when we talked about this, but the purpose of having this is so that truckers aren't parking their vehicles on the streets. Is that correct? We, are, we, we do have our hamlets um, signed that no trucks. Trucks that, trucks that are doing, um, people that are moving from their homes have every right to be there because they have a scheduled delivery. Um, if there was a commercial business where a truck was dropping off, um, goods and, and, and whatnot, those would be permitted. Any Anything otherwise, our, our hamlet roads are not designed to withstand, withstand the weight of those trucks. So we've had cost savings measures by, by uh, reducing um, the capability of, of weight um, on our roads in the hamlets, and we, we want to ensure that we protect that. The truck parking that we're talking about in Rolling Hills, 
uh, we have people that work in the industry that do truck, whether it's cattle, whether it's oil and gas, they are parking their trucks like six miles south of town on a roadside turnout and that's where it sits. It's not near any residence, not near where they are and um, we talked about we have people that live within our communities that some of these considerations maybe want to be considered by council and uh, if we don't provide some of these opportunities for those people, they move. So the decision is really for, for council to um, debate and approve. I guess I, uh, my point on, like I'm a little bit on the fence about is it the municipality's um, responsibility to provide um, parking for an individual that's their livelihood? Like, I guess I, I just look at it, it's $100,000 to invest. And, and is this county land we're putting it on? This this is county land in Rolling Hills. Um, second consideration, we'll be moving forward with one in Tilly as well. Mm -hmm, and then considerations that. for the rest of the Hamlets. Now, I don't know if that's going to include Lake Nola Resort because obviously we're close enough to the city of Brooks. Um, we don't have anybody parking trucks or have any expectations of parking trucks at the resort, but uh, Scandi is potentially another one. Really repurposing the uh, raw water ponds that used to be used at the water dis at the water treatment facilities that are now distribution facilities. Those those are the options that we're looking at for county land. So my question um, in talking about this parking area is dust control. Um, I've seen those large lots where when the wind picks up, they become a, a blizzard storm. So are we incorporating control into the costs? We have not included any costs for dust control on any of those sites, no. Okay. That might be something to keep in mind because I've seen that time over time, especially if they're on the northwest side of the hamlet or something like that. Other questions? Ellen. Hi, Mark. Question. Um, curb scudders swales to assist in wetlands acres, 65,000. Would that also be a um, frontage tax or a local improvement tax, if you will? Right now it comes out of uh, restricted surplus. Can you repeat that one for me, please? Sure. It is the... Um, what page, Ellen? Page 12 of 146 of the uh, capital projects, and it's the Westland Acres Curb, Gutter, and Swales, and it's $65,000 budgeted, and I'm just wondering if this would fall under a local improvement tax. It isn't currently. Um, generally, the the municipality has dealt with storm water, so if that is a consideration of council, then we would have to go through likely open house process with the public to make that happen. I can tell you that the way that the county approved the development to be constructed originally that swales and stuff should have been part of the plan because a gravel swale has not been successful for us in the past. We have standing water, we have frost boils and everything else. We've been in there numerous years in a row, which is why we actually had this in the 2019 budget. So it's a carry forward item for 2020 because we didn't get to it. Uh, we're realizing the same thing out in Lake Newell Resort as well that uh, some of the um, approaches to the main street uh, should have had concrete aprons or swales in them instead of asphalt. And uh, those expenditures are adding up for us as well. And that's why we were looking at concrete swales. Those are things that I would propose council uh, really look at that when we adopt new standards and, and construction specifications and stuff um, for developers that these are the things that get it done right and that we don't have to burden our taxpayers with in the future as we're proposing today. 
See, the reason I'm asking is because of um, Tilly and uh, Scandia, right? They have the local improvement tax for their, their gutters and streets, correct? No, uh, Scandia and Tilly only uh, have local improvements on their water and wastewater. The county took care of the roads. Okay, Ellen. So, Mark, it's a uh, an expenditure to prevent further costs, basically. Yeah, improvement to everything, convey that water, get it out of our roads so that we're not spending time and money on repairs. Okay. Other questions? Oh, carry on. Function 33, as council should be aware, this is a 50-50 partnership with the City of Brooks where the City of Brooks takes the lead on the airport. Um, we just contribute. I don't think I have anything much more to say about this. Uh, I do wish that um, we had some kind of metrics or, or something to measure the airport by. Uh, I, I haven't had anything produced to me from the City of Brooks to find out how many uh, takeoffs or landings or what size of uh, um, airplanes, helicopters and stuff are using it. Uh, they are managing the fuel system, which is uh, full cost recovery. Um, I don't really have anything to feed council other than these is the predicted uh, cost for the airport and we're in it for 50-50. So I guess if there's any questions around that, uh, I will probably take your question and get some answers and have to get back to you, but uh, it looks pretty status quo with the airport. And I can't find it right now, but in one of the, um, I think explanations in the front where it came under the airport, they did highlight the uh, automated navigation system that's still part of it and that's not correct okay just in the budget narrative yeah okay I just Thank wanted you. it to be accurate other questions regarding the airport Ellen? Just out of curiosity, do pilots that fly in and out, do they pay a certain rent or what have you, or landing No, uh, no there's, there's no fees for use of the, of the municipal airport. And I guess furthermore to that, if there was, um, it, it's an unmanned airport where it would uh, come down to be an honor system of tracking flights in and out. Lionel? Yeah, we don't have a really good hand on the usage of the airport because it's a voluntary system to register when you come in, but not many do. Those pilots, eh? <laughs> they can't afford it anymore after they buy their airplanes. So. I think I think the biggest movements, just if you're curious, is it would be the aerial applicators, and that's extensively from June till the end of September, and I don't know, it'd be in the thousands for them. But other than that, recreational-wise, I think there was a study done years ago when they were looking at upgrades and sort of a five-year plan. And um, just based on the limited information that they were, I think recreation-wise, they're looking at under 100 a week and uh, uh, 50 or so medevacs, and then the rest are ag services. Are there airport questions? No, oh, all right, carry on to water. Well, function 41, I'll uh, speak to most of the operations side of things. I don't know when Matt wants to talk water rates and stuff, but we do kind of partner on this GL here. Um, again, as usual, we, we have the contracted service of NRSC uh, performing our operating 
day-to-day uh, -day operations of checking plants, quality of water, uh, metering of the uh, rural water system, sending us the invoices on those sorts of things. So th this is all very status quo um, for everything in Function 41, and uh, I would even divulge the same for, for Function 42. Uh, we don't have any anticipated uh, costs really coming out of this um, of any significance. We, we have carry-forward items uh, that we do still want to get in, just ran out of time to be able to do anything, but waterline locating in Patricia and Rainier so that we get accurate um, as-built records of where these pipelines are and what they uh, consist of for pipe type and size. Um, we have carry-forward item that uh, NRSC will be moving forward with the replacing of uh, the computers in Rolling Hills, Patricia and Rainier. Uh, they work with MP Engineering on the specifications of those computers for the SCADA system so that those numbers are numbers and alarms and things are reported directly back to them and their operators after hours. Uh, Rolling Hills uh, installed drainage in the pump house, so since we decommissioned the raw water pond and stuff, they do have some, uh, some water that they have to discharge out of that building from time to time due to some of their processes and procedures, so we'll be looking at a solution for that, but that too is a uh, carry forward item that didn't get dealt with this year. And then uh, the other thing was that we didn't get the sampling stations in Hamlets installed as uh, we had originally hoped to have done this year. Uh, and our NRC will be taking a lead on making sure that they get those cited where they need them, uh, collaborating with us uh, to get them installed because it'll be tying into infrastructure in our roads and stuff like that. So um, carry forward items and, and nothing really new out of uh, Function 41. Um, did you want to talk water rates now or you want to do that later? I'm pretty sure we're settled on water rates. <laughs> so that's what I got for 41. Questions, Kevin? Madam Reeve, Mark, I think one thing that we should follow up on is a request from Councillor Amelung to look at the hydrovac costs that we've paid out the hours at the service capacity that they've done maybe over the last couple, three years, uh, just so that we can do a uh, analysis of the little unit versus the big unit in a little more detail. I know the system has our, we use typically three or four of the hydrovac companies, so it shouldn't be uh, too difficult. Emery? And just an additional thought about that hydrovac. You mentioned that Brooks has a big one, so would it maybe be um, helpful to check what kind of unit they have, how, how often they use it, and if there could be a partnership? Good suggestions all around. Anything else? Okay. Function 42, wastewater. Not much to say. Carry forward item was to see the effluent discharge meters installed in Rolling Hills and Scandia and NRSC will again be taking care of that one. Um, that's all I got for you. Pretty status quo. We've done a lot the last 10 years to water and wastewater systems. So this is, this is what we find when we come to budget. It's nice. It is good. Any questions? Okay, keep going. Function 43. Tilly Landfill Reclamation. We've had this one on the books for a while. Um, We've just come to the realization we are not going to be able to do this work in-house as we anticipated. We thought we'd be able to get our truck drivers to move uh, the clay quantities. We thought we'd be able to get some of our equipment out there. Uh, we're pretty standardized in our operations. We, we, need, we need the 120 days to get the gravel program done. We need the time required to get the stockpiling done. We need the other time in between to get snow plowing and stuff done. We really don't have much time in between to be able to try and move in quantities of dirt um, and, and messing around in a landfill. We do have uh, a preliminary design that we want to have uh, reaffirmed before we move with any of that work, but we do want to contract it out and get it off the liability list 
and the uh, money sitting in the account is is already there for this reclamation. So if we can do it within the, what do we got, 150? Two, $253,000, I'm sure that we'll be able to get uh, contracted service to take care of that for us. And finally get that off the liability account since we, since the dissolution of the Hamlet, I guess. So, is there any questions on 43? Kelly. Is that where the parking lot will go in Tilly eventually? Yeah, no, unfortunately not for that one. Uh, there is a uh, there is potentially over top of the old, old Tilly landfill might be where it goes, which is actually right across the road from where the, the campground is and the, and the ball diamonds. Um, apparently that is where the old, old, old landfill is. I, I don't know how many olds I can say with that. But. You were close, Kelly. You were close. <laughs> All right. That's it. No, we have one more uh, new to falling under the umbrella for myself would be the planning and development function. Uh, council already knows what transpired earlier this year with uh, planning services. Um, we did have a retirement. We have a new staff member in place as the supervisor of planning and development services. Jeff has taken over responsibility of management of planning and development services. We will be looking at everything moving throughout the next 12 months um, to see what needs to happen in that department. Uh, there may be op opportunities where we just get some more coaching and develop the understanding within our own staff that maybe we have the ability to do a little bit more in-house than what we contracted in the past. But as of right now, we're looking at maintaining status quo. And uh, if things change, hopefully it's at less uh, contracted service in the future, but uh, we're status quo as it sits. Kevin? Madam Reeve, just want to comment, Mark. Um, so the transition with Jeff is working extremely well. Um, I don't know if we're in the calm before the storm, but it's sure a breath of fresh air to have the department's functioning as one. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Anything else? Tracy. For the um, cost for um, the Alberta Safety Codes and for ORSC, is that under other general contracted services? I just, I wasn't sure. Safety codes is a line item under uh, the 2290 account. Okay, so, okay. And then ORSC is... $2,236 for 80000 a year. If you're looking at page 118, you're looking at the bottom three. Marie? Um, if I could go back to uh, roads, overlay and uh, paving. You mentioned uh, earlier that there are some roads that don't need an overlay according to the schedule that you have, like they last longer. So are you, and I'm guessing the answer is yes, are you adjusting your schedule as you find out if roads could be ex you know, um, delayed because they don't need the overlay, you take another one and get it done, and could we maybe get some short paving projects in there if we save money? So, so what we look at is uh, we're looking at the best management practices for um, paved roads. Generally, anywhere between that 17 and, and 20 year mark is where a lot of roads require overlay. I can speak from experience, previously working for the city of Brooks. Uh, there are roads in the, in the city when I worked there that had 42 years on them. Um, based on your philosophies, sometimes you allow roads to degrade and deteriorate so far that your intention is to fully replace them. Other cases, you do your overlay or you do microsurfacing or you can do a number of other treatments to prolong that uh, life of that pavement. So in, in our program, we have looked at the 20 year life cycle for overlay leading into that year of 1819 
is when we want to try to catch that for some engineering services for falling weight deflectometer to find out whether the subgrade has the, the structural capability of continuing or whether we're going to be into uh, greater repairs and, and replacements of things. Um, so we would still like to leave that 20 years in there. I think, um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball to tell me the true future of every single segment of roadway out there. Some roads, based on traffic, we're going to see that they have a shorter life expectancy. Some other roads, we're going to find that they have a longer life expectancy. What we want to do is look at that 20 year mark, keep our eyes on the ground, seeing uh, if there's any rutting or if there's any raveling happening in the road, significant cracking in the road, um, and, and try to catch those things at the optimal time so that we know that we're investing uh, in the best interest of our repairs. Sometimes we're going to see it extended. I think sometimes we're potentially going to see that those life expectancies are shortened. I can't really tell you that we're going to be able to say, yeah, let's move it to a 25 year life expectancy and that's how it's going to be for everything. Because then we might get burned that we're going to have to do something prematurely and we won't have the, the funding in place through amortization. If council wants to consider something alternative to that, then uh, I can take your lead, but based on industry best practices and stuff, that's how we're trying to lead the charge into pavement management. Okay. Kevin? I'll just add a couple uh, more points to that. I think it's, it's important that we have the money away in our restricted reserve. Um, to delay, it makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases, if, if you can, as long as you have the money put away. Obviously, you generate the interest on that money. Um, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is sometimes that economies to scale of size of project, location of project, sometimes it makes more sense to do that uh, a little bit earlier in a, in a big scale. But I think we need to keep an eye on that restricted reserve surplus. I, I don't have my cheat notes in front of me, but uh, I believe it's about $111 million over the 10 years that we're going to be drawing from that fund. Um, so we always have to make sure that that fund is, is sufficient to, to handle these projects. As long as that's there, then managing it makes it a lot easier. If the money gets pulled from the reserve, that's a different, uh, different scale. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, we'll switch over to Todd, or are you doing more, Mark, here? Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Welcome, Todd. Thanks for having me, Molly. Well, sure tough, appreciate the invite. Thought we'd let you come. We don't see you that often. No, and I do apologize for missing last Thursday. Nothing really went right for me. So <laughs> there are days like that. Although Will said uh, you guys were very nice to him, so I do appreciate that. <laughs> if you scare him, we'll have no replacement for Todd. <laughs> All right, just joking. So I guess budget, uh, we kind of did, we dived a little bit deeper this year than we have in the past. We did, uh, we ran three year averages with Matt and I thought it was very interesting to see the ups and the downs, um, pretty much where we would expect them because we see it all the time um, and where we were kind of maybe high on our budget numbers, Matt helped us pull some stuff out. So that was good. Uh, I think it just goes to show that we, we truly do look at the, this stuff very closely. Um, in terms of ag services, I think everything pretty much is status quo. We don't intend to uh, stop doing anything we have been doing. Um, so a lot of the numbers would reflect that. Um, there's really not too many huge ups and downs, I guess. We're pulling a few thousands here and there. Um, the equipment, machinery, and vehicle repairs, we did suck out, uh, what well, says here, about 7%, um, which is pretty much just normalizing the number. 
uh, when Joe goes through and he kind of takes stock of what everything looks like, whether it be tires or equipment up, um, updates that need to happen, uh, that's the stuff he writes down and, and we kind of take that forward. So when, when we looked at our three-year averages, we were still not spending what Joe thought we would be spending. So we just kind of normalized that number a little bit. And then when you get down to the uh, other materials, goods and supplies, which is a 2590 account. Um, many, many years ago, uh, I had to come in front of you and ask for a few thousand dollars to spend. And it was decided at that time that we would put in a little bit of a contingency so that we had some money for those whoopsies that we missed uh, during a budget cycle. And what we did was we just took that $10,000 contingency, which we hadn't been using, um, and, and put it down to 5,500, which puts another 4,500 back in the bank. So those are some, kind of some cool things. I mean, they're, they're pretty small numbers in the grand scheme of things, but we don't run big numbers in ag services. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, what else Matt's got here? Uh, we obviously had Harold retire in 2019. Um, so we had some transition period in there for him. So we've removed that position now. Um, so that's where that uh, little bit of money comes back for the uh, wages. And uh, I guess on the capital side, the one kind of new ticket item that we've been considering for many years is a kind of a new 40 to 60 horsepower tractor, um, something that's utilized uh, not only in our own services, but with our, with our partner services. So we currently use the tractor that belongs to the city. Um, it's, a, it's an undersized tractor and it's a big sprayer on the back. So Kim, uh, we joke because Kim wears his cowboy hat when he's driving it because it's often a rodeo. Um, because when we fill the sprayer up with chemical uh, for the first half an hour, it's difficult to, st to steer <laughs> because you either put a half a tank of water in the back or you fill it up and you be careful. So we fill it up and be careful, uh, but Kim still wears his cowboy hat and we think it's quite funny. Um, but we've, we've asked the city, you know, because um, as, as part of our, our partnership, the city's mentioned a few times that that was in their capital plans was to purchase a tractor and it's just continually been, uh, they've, they've readjusted their priorities and we haven't been able to see a new unit um, to use in that program. Um, so that's the, when we hold our last kind of toolbox meeting in August, we have great discussions at our, our safety meeting about things that we're missing in our programming to make things better. And this is one thing that's continually came up. So we kind of started to, to plan for it and talk about it. And we, we hope that uh, that would be something that would uh, be considered, I guess. Um, and then along with that would just be a, a 20 foot hooded sprayer. We, uh, we do a lot of great work. I think we control wise with a lot of great partners. Uh, the, the, the problem seems to be that it all happens at the same time. So having good equipment to be ready and available when we need it is, is quite important to us. And that's about all I had for that. I could suggest that you sit in the front of the tractor, Todd. <laughs> But have we ever considered putting a few weights in the front? Yeah, we have uh, as many suitcase weights on the front of that thing as will fit on it right now. Yeah. Put another tank up front there and fill it with water. Yeah. What I was uh, wondering about, if you take your egg services, um, the difference between uh, your net expenditures and your income, the draw on the mill is, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, it's about $400,000. Uh, net impact to the mill for ag services, one point, just about seven million for 2020. And the draw currently proposed is 1.2, so a little better, I think, 1.3. I'm, I'm not sure which one you're looking at. I'm, if I look at uh, just... If you the add the 7% that were initially proposed, I guess. I'm oh, looking at okay. that difference. And what would that have, what would that have to, uh, what percentage would that have to change in order to get closer to that, covering the cost of ag services from farmland Requisition. Okay, now I'm I'm picking up on what you're laying down, and that could be for later. Like this is yeah, maybe I'll, a discussion for later. But I just wanted to, because we because we have Todd here and 
we are talking ag services and this is budget day so I just wanted to throw that out about the consideration yeah I'll, I'll get that number for you I think we're, we were around seven eight hundred thousand that we're we're raising from from ag I could have it pretty quick here for you because it was in our uh, planning meeting that we had that <clears throat> Yeah, 2019, 786,000, and we had 1.5 million. So we were 800,000 shy for, for 2019. So we just about need to double on, on farmland if farmland was going to pay all of what Ag Service does for us. Just a question, Matt. Do you know how Lethbridge County? Uh, I think their mill rates are around 24 mills on farmland, so they must fund more than egg services with that. I, I'll, uh, I'll look at what, what else that covers, because I know Lethbridge County doesn't have anything hardly in terms of uh, non-res. And then they also have their uh, special feedlot tax on, on top, right? Funding road. So, yeah, we're not, not Lethbridge County yet. Um, my question was, um, under vehicles, you have a replacement of Unit 163, and it's only a 2018. What, what is the need for a replacement? Because you've got other units that are way older, and and it's 35,000, so just wondering. Yeah, I agree, Tracy. I just really like to drive a new vehicle every year. But that's uh, that 163 is part of Mark's um, enterprise, enterprise Agreement. That, that leasing agreement. So we extended it from September to May, but but I do like to drive a new vehicle every year. Anything else? Hubie? Is CP real happy with your chemical spraying on the tracks? Well, Hubie, they never really mention it, um, but they, they very much should be. Uh, we, we have a great GPS database of every weed that we manage on their property, and, uh, and we do a good job of each and every single one of them. So if I was them looking from Ottawa, I would say, geez, that county renewal does a great job, but I don't know that they look that often. Yeah. And I'm a... Speaking of vehicles for Tracy, you mentioned that we have some old ones, and 305 was uh, sitting in the shop. It was the 2005 when I first walked in, my very first morning. It was in the shop getting lights and decals put on it. And I looked at Steve, and I said, oh, my God, I can't believe he bought me a new vehicle. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. <laughs> and I never got to drive that truck for another five years. But uh, <laughs> anyways, it's going away now, and I'm kind of, it's just like bittersweet. It's, these things aren't supposed to happen. <laughs> but... Anyways, just thought that was a funny story, but it turns out not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and then that new vehicle will go under the fleet. Um, that Okay, good. Now this equipment, for example, the 20-foot uh, hooded sprayer, um, it's being used with partnerships. Do we recoup any cost from that? We do, yes. Anything that we use of our own that we, um, whether we're spraying for Pisano, grasslands, brooks, all those different partners, we do, we charge out back the hourly costs of those units. Yep. Other questions? Anything else? Moving on. Parks and programs, is that separate? Yeah. yeah, the parks one is 72. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, you want There's stuff between 62 and 72. Does that matter? Or do I just go ahead? You can... This is your, uh, your soapbox, Todd. You just go ahead, Todd. Don't All right, worry thank about you. that big... 
Well, okay. but Emerson's actually pretty status quo next year. Um, almost uh, nothing really changed. Um, if you look at the numbers right now in the 2019 year to date, we look like we did an absolutely fantastic job because we're up $8,000, which we've never been in the in the pluses before. Um, but we haven't actually transferred all the um, the internal expenses back. So we'd use ag services uh, equipment and and uh, and labor down there, and we haven't made that transfer. But I thought I would point out that 8,000 and for the good is is fantastic. Just it won't be like that for long. Um, so outside of that, I think Emerson, like I said, status quo. We got a few things to do. We uh, we created a little parking lot in the overflow, and we're gonna you know gravel it this year, and and maybe throw some parking blocks up. Um, that's kind of yeah. Like I say, Emerson is just gonna be Emerson. I think for a few years, we don't really have any big plans. If that's okay with you guys, I mean, I'm happy to do more if we want to do more, um, but it seems like everything's running pretty good. So. Thoughts, Tracy, question? Um, Todd, at one time you talked about researching um, an, a booster or something for the cell phone cell coverage. Where is that and is that an, a budget item for this year or? Yeah, sadly it's, it's not gonna be a budget item for this year unless we uh, make an adjustment or a, what do you call that? Is it adjustment? Yeah. Adjustment at, at some point. Um, I haven't heard back. Uh, we've been talking to a company out of Calgary that was down to uh, to give us some feedback earlier this summer. Um, they did make some suggestions that we did later in the season, um, but we we don't know if there's anything better yet. They just haven't given us those numbers. So um, it sounds like it's more of a <laughs> it's more of a setup problem on the top. So that's the stuff we changed. We put uh, different antennas and we. I don't understand it all, but uh, we did some stuff that improved it for, for what we seen in September when we were working down there, it was improved. But again, we start to lose, le lose leaves in September, um, and that's typically what they say is our problem, is we have these wonderful big trees that block the signals. So I don't know. It seems like it works in May, and it doesn't work in June and July, and then it kind of starts again in August and September. So it's... Um, it's a pain for sure, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely keep you updated if, if we get some uh, really genius ideas, for sure. Todd, I know it's a, uh, been a safety concern of ours with, for staff, but what do the, uh, I mean, some people would be happy that there's no cell service, others would be terrified to live without cell service. Yeah, it's odd, because we don't actually hear much about the cell service, it's the data more. Oh. that they're not allowed to use, or not able to oh, use the okay. internet. Um, a lot of communication is via text, we all know that, and that's you know through iMessaging or whatever it is, data, um, emails or, or on-call apps and things like that, um, they're not functioning, and that's more of the problem than making phone calls. Hmm. Um, but yeah, we, it's, uh, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I like when I go down there and can't receive a phone call. I think that's fantastic. I get some quality family time. My wife's not on the Facebook. It's fantastic. Uh, but not everybody is the same as me, so that's, and that's okay. Um, we, we took a drive down to Dinosaur Park. I probably told you guys this. They put in a very extensive program uh, down there for, for internet service, but almost nothing for cell service except to their staff housing. So it's... Uh, it seems like that the, the internet service is more important than the cell is actually, and we mm. kind of piggyback them. So. Interesting. All right, any other questions? Otherwise that uh, finishes off Todd's portion. Thanks, Todd. Oh, something else? Okay, we, we do touch a little bit of the 12 administration account with uh, facility stuff, and Matt just wondered if I could uh, sure. chat about the automated east gate. Um, that's something that's been brought up by, uh, by the municipal services crew. They're primarily the ones that go in and out of that gate. Um, currently, it's a really, it was, it was maybe an oversight when we first um, put that fence structure in. Um, we, we didn't I guess when we built this facility, we didn't know we were gonna need all this extra space in that east yard. Um, and then we quickly realized that we didn't have enough space in our compound for things like culverts and posts and the random stuff. Um, so that's when we uh, did that east yard. 
Um, then, of course, when you have all that nice, wonderful stuff in the east yard, you need to have some means of making sure that it doesn't walk away without you. Uh, because we have a wonderful inventory system here, we don't want that. Um, so we put in that gate um, and that, that short stretch of fence. The problem was we got a 30-foot chain link gate out of it. And uh, when the wind blows and uh, it opens uh, with the guys in the morning, those kinds of things, we're, we're seeing a fair amount of Joe having to repair things all the time. And apparently it's a really heavy gate to open and shut. So they were wondering if there was a way to automate that system. Um, and so Joe did the, the research on it and it sounds like it is very, um, it's easily attainable, it just costs money like everything else. Um, so we would just put a punch pad in so that we would still have a gate code access, but the actual function of the gate would not be by our guys. It would be by a gate opener, similar to the other ones. Sorry, I can't remember who asked the question. Nobody asked the question. I was just talking. My bad. Oh, sorry. Looking, uh, it's estimated about 22000 So the problem here is the wind is a real, makes it hard to open and close. So how much estimate have, are you estimating for damages when the wind's blowing and that thing's automatically opening and closing? Because I'll bet you it's going to get damaged. Yeah, I, I don't know, Wayne. I, I don't, uh, honestly, I don't open and shut it a whole lot, uh, but it is a big old heavy gate. Um, all of our gates are... It'd be nice if they were a different setup because when the wind is howling from the north, that's when they all start whipping and get out of place. Um, we did put new rollers on to try to alleviate some of that, um, but it, it didn't do it all, I guess. Um, so I guess, I, I don't know, uh, Wayne, I don't even know how to answer that really. Well, <laughs> from my standpoint, I love that, but uh, I don't, I guess uh, it, it is my job to sit here and tell you why these projects should happen and need to happen, but I'm not the guy always out there um, that sees why they need to happen and should happen. So it's hard to, but it'd be hard to get a, maybe one of our staff or, or uh, one of the truck drivers that uses it all the time to maybe come up with the best solutions here. So the concept is to prevent more damage. And I guess to make things a little, um, easier on everybody we often use a it has a, just like any other man gate or normal chain link gate it has a little pin lock thing in there we don't get to use that very often because the gates are always out of out of line um, so we just have a normal chain that wraps around it I guess there's maybe some security question there but I don't, I don't know if anything's ever perfect in this kind of wind that's wind Well, gates are always a struggle in uh, the western part of Canada. Somebody left a gate open. I always go, who is this somebody? Because, you know, it's never anybody that will own up to it. But it's funny, gate. Brian? I, I don't pretend to overthink this too much, but have they considered two gates that slide together and link in the middle? Um, they're, that way they're not quite as long. Yeah, there, well, there is currently two gates. One's a 30-footer and one's about 15 feet. But, so. Mark, do you have something to add? Just to continue to what Claude talked about, I have driven out of the yard and seen that gate left open. I know very well why the gate could not open because people have been able to budget. So I would say that uh, the gate is going to be going through the process of that not being acceptable to myself. It's not the easiest gate. It never has been. 
Okay. I can tell this is going to be the one little item that we spend <laughs> hours on. Wayne. I'm thinking that maybe we should be looking at the whole gate. If this thing isn't working very well, I mean, okay, maybe it'll cost more than 20, but maybe in the long run, it's the cheapest way to go is to get a better gate in there. Uh, I'm just making a comment here. Thank you. Okay. Ellen? Just getting back to the tractor, was that the $60,000 one? And at, at currently we share that with, no, that was owned by the city? It is, right? Uh, the city owns an old John Deere two-wheel drive tractor, yes. So is there a consideration to uh, co-own, if you will? Or is that not a good plan? I guess we never really gave that part consideration. We were always hoping that they would purchase it and then we would just use it. Um, just never happened in their processes. Other questions? Okay, we will let Mark and or let Todd escape. Thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. R Roberta is joining us. Can we take a five-minute comfort break, please? <laughs>